Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I've got a, one little piece of housekeeping. Does everybody have one of these? No. That was just one no, really? Oh, two no's. Oh, a lot of no's. Okay. <laughs> Here's uh, three, four, maybe five here. So yeah, please pass these. If you have extras, there's probably no extra extras, real extras. Um, so this is, so we're gonna do a lot of work today and um, these, these little uh, worksheets um, have a few exercises that we're gonna run through. Some of them we're not gonna do today, but I put them in there because I think you'll find them helpful, if not today, in 30 days. Um, so I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Um, my work is in leadership transitions, and so um, I've been doing this for, for many years, and most of our clients are large multinationals, but we work with leaders at all levels throughout those organizations all over the world. We do coaching and we do workshops for them. Um, so what I've done is taken the work that we do for leaders, I've shrunk it down a little bit into something that's pragmatic and practical for you. Um, all of this I think you should do, and we'll do some of it today. Um, I ask that you sit with your pairs. Is everybody sitting with the folks that they're gonna be working with? Great, uh, because some of this is um, work that you're gonna be doing together. Um, uh, only a little bit of this you'll be doing on your own. So I'll just give you a, a brief introduction. Um, so my background is in leadership um, and in entrepreneurship. I've worked with startup companies. I've helped a lot of people make starts. Um, either starting companies, starting new roles. Um, so I'd be happy to take questions, um, specific questions, but since there's so many of us, I'm going to stay a little bit high level and talk about what I think will be of concern for, um, for everybody here. Um, let's see. Um, and in addition to this group, at this level, I also um, do a similar workshop at, um, for MBAs um, at MIT in Boston. Um, so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk about why transitions are a focal point and why, what, you want, what you need to know about transitions. You're gonna be making transitions like this um, throughout your life, throughout your careers, and so what you're learning today will be helpful in the future. Um, so this just this little bit that you're gonna learn now and use now, you can pull this out anytime you're making a transition into a new role. Um, we're gonna talk about why transitions are so challenging, um, what are some common pitfalls that people make, how you can avoid them, um, why learning is such a critical component uh, of, of what you're doing as you're facing a new, a new job and we've got a framework for learning. Um, and we're gonna be very pragmatic and help you prepare today for your forthcoming transition. And as I said, this, um, this takeaway is something you can use in this transition and in the future. So why are transitions so challenging? Um, I have the good fortune to have co-founded my company with um, the world's leading thinker on leadership transition. So we have a lot of research that informs our work. We have access to a lot of, a lot of people. We have done work with um, global HR leaders and most, more than anything else, they, any other business challenge, they think transitions are the most challenging time their leaders face. Um, and that the success or failure that people see within the first 90 days in your new role is really a determinant of whether or not you're going to succeed. Um, and, and, you know, I love this quote from Abe Lincoln. Um, really, you know, if you're, the more preparation you can do now and the more uh, the faster you can learn, the more you can prepare to take your role on, the better you're gonna do. Um, some people think of the time before they take a new role as a time to relax, to take a vacation because you're gonna be working hard. But I'll tell you that th any work that you do now, any learning that you do now is gonna pay off um, hugely um, when you enter your new role. Um, and there are, so, there are some common transition traps that people make. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about them. Um, if you walk into an organization, um, I'd suggest that you really wanna have bright eyes, wide open eyes, and be really trying to learn. Um, tr don't, as much as you may be bringing specific knowledge into your 
job, and as much as you might have very relevant experience, um, you don't want to come in thinking that you have the answer. You really want to be receptive at first and learning. Um, people um, people are, have, have expectations of you before you walk through the door, um, and you have expectations of them when you're walking through the door, but you want to try and hold back on that and keep your eyes open. Um, you also, I'm sure all of you are very ambitious people. Um, that's why you're here. Um, but you want to... Uh, try not to over uh, commit yourself. Try not to say yes to too many things. You can always add things to your plate, um, but you want to try and be realistic about what you commit to doing, what you commit to delivering, um, especially when you're first walking through the door. Um, getting captured by the wrong people, sometimes you, know, you don't know what you're what the what you're facing when you walk through that door and what people's agendas are, um, and some people might latch on to you for certain reasons that have to do with their own personal agendas. You want to be careful about latching on to people very quickly. Um, you first want to figure out who's who and, and what's going to benefit you most in your role. You have one year if that's really not a lot of time, um, and you you're going to need to use your time very um, very carefully during that during that, um, your fellowship. Um, we all set unrealistic expectations. Sometimes we see a big picture, we want to do a lot. Um, I'd say that um, you want to, it's okay to have high expectations and it's okay to want to uh, experience a lot or achieve a lot, um, but you want to revisit your expectations. You really, you're probably going to want to readjust those over time. Um, and the biggest reason why people fail in any organization when they come in is that they can't adapt or work within the culture. Um, clearly that's gonna be a challenge for, for everybody in this room. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about culture later, so um, you can have, um, and I'll have all of you talking about culture amongst yourselves so that you can share um, and help that learning process along. This is just a little bit of research that we did where we showed the benefit of accelerating a transition. I mean, literally all the work that I do is about accelerating transitions, and there's a lot of ways you can work with people to help them accelerate, um, but it will create, if people, if everybody that's entering a new role has more time, takes the time to stop and think and plan and structure what they're going to be doing, they, everything gets done faster. It's sometimes a little counterintuitive because you wanna rush forward and you wanna get things done um, but you really need to stop and pause and think, and the time that you invest in reading the first 90 days, I, I suggest you all read the first five chapters at least. That's gonna be an investment in doing everything better and faster in the long run. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the framework and the tools but um, the first 90 days is sold in 27 languages around the world. It's a business bestseller. Um, it's um, something that everybody um, in senior leadership knows about this book. And the reason why, and Heather knows, <laughs> that's why she asked us to come here, because it's, um, the, the economist called it the onboarding Bible. Um, and really, people have it on their shelf, and every time they're taking on a new role, there's certain things that you're gonna wanna do. And so, um, it's great that Heather brought us here so we can share this with you. Um, but as you, as you go to, you know, as you, as you go throughout your, in your life, but especially your fellowship now, you're gonna wanna use this book. Um, but right now I'm gonna have you um, in groups of four or five, but make sure that you're with your pairs. Um, discuss what you think the biggest challenges are. Oh, so in your, you're gonna use this throughout. This first page, um, the one that is assessing your strengths and weaknesses, I, I know that you've done this and you'll, you've probably done this throughout your lives. I put this here not for us to use right now, but I think it's something that um, deserves um, some consideration. You can do this personally. Sometimes your strengths can be your biggest weaknesses. Sometimes you're, you know, I'm a very analytical person. That's not, not always useful. Um, sometimes you need to just roll with it and you can't actually analyze a decision, you just have to make a decision. So, and, but in certain circumstances, that's a strength. So we all have strengths that can be weaknesses. 
Um, weaknesses can be, you know, if you have a weakness, sometimes you're not, either you're not, you shouldn't set yourself up for failure with that weakness. If you're not good at something, then don't do it. Try and find somebody else to do it. There are some weaknesses you can change and you can improve yourself, you can learn how to do things, but some weaknesses you don't want to battle. Um, but and, and you may not have an opportunity to battle them this year, maybe you battle them you know, next year or something. So I think it's worth taking some time to thinking about your strengths and weaknesses and how they'll, they'll make you vulnerable in your task. But right here, identifying challenges op and opportunities, I'd like you to use that as um, in your pairs and in a discussion to say what, are gonna, what, what about the environment you're entering is gonna be a challenge and where do you see opportunities? Now, everything that we're doing enter. here now and the discussions you're having now are definitely um, discussions I assume will be continuing. So your dialogues about what your opportunities are and what your challenges are, I'm glad they're so, uh, you're so enthusiastic about that. But you'll probably want to have these same discussions again once you've entered you're, you know, within the next 30 days or so, you're gonna wanna maybe take this out and revisit it because you'll have learned a, a few more things. So I'm assuming that many of you, uh, many, many of the challenges you're looking at look like an unfamiliar organization or an unfamiliar culture, um, how you're gonna transition into that culture and that both the organizational culture um, as well as the ethnic culture. Um, you're probably dealing with multiple stakeholders. You know, how many bosses are you gonna have? How many people uh, have an interest in your work, have something at stake with your success and the work that you're doing? Um, you may end up reporting to multiple people um, and that's challenging because you want all of your stakeholders to be happy. Um, and the organiza organizations you're entering are going to be, you know, dealing with whatever they're coping with. Um, and there may be different pockets of success and challenge within the organizations you're facing. Um, so um, some part of the organization could be in crisis or some part of the organization could be a new or a startup entity that you're working in and there could be a sustaining, a nice organization that has a sustaining culture and, and success that you're looking at. Um, but there'll be different components of that throughout the organization. And I think for about 15% of you, this is a, newly, a new thing. Um, and sometimes when you enter a new role in an organization, they don't necessarily know how they're gonna use you and what you're doing. That can be really frustrating. I was in that position once where I was sitting at a desk, like ready to work and nobody had anything for me to do. <laughs> that was a really difficult situation because I didn't know how to spend my time. And I was like, are they testing me <laughs> to see what I'm gonna do? Um, and uh, I had to figure out how to use my time productively. Um, and that can be a challenge. Now, um, is there anything that, I'd like to take some notes and maybe um, talk about some challenges at the end. I'm gonna leave um, a few minutes at the end of the presentation. Is there anything I didn't cover that's sort of not on that list that's a big deal that people wanna discuss, a challenge they think they're gonna be facing? <coughs> yes. Sorry. Yeah. So I'm, I'm worrying about being compared <coughs> when I get there and people will be like, oh, she's not as good as so-and-so and how they did such a good job and they had all these innovative ideas. Yeah, yeah. I, I get that. So just to sort of flesh that out, um, she's worried about uh, who she's succeeding. So y the expectations of you are set somewhat when you walk through the door based on what who preceded you and what they did um, and you know, it's interesting because we deal with leaders in corporate America, and if, you've, if, you're, fa if you're succeeding somebody who's been great, it's really hard because um, you know, if you're succeeding someone who did a terrible job, then the world is your oyster. You know, you, you're gonna look great no matter what. Um, I, I, and so dealing with a, you know, what they did before you, I think take your time, figure out what they did before you. Don't try and do what they did. Try and figure out how you're gonna make your mark and where your background and your, what's special about you what's special about your opportunity and, uh, and how you can make your own mark. 
don't look. <laughs> yes. Oh, do you want me to take that? The song. Okay, sorry. Uh, there are two things we talked about in our group, and the first was um, just wanting to make sure the staff doesn't dismiss us as a temporary staff member, since we are just there for one year. I'm sure we will be respected. I mean, the organizations have been vetted in the process, but at the same time, you know, we are just there for one year. Um, and then something for me is I'm just like so excited about my placement organization, and so I just want to maintain that momentum and that positive energy mm -hmm. throughout the whole year. Mm -hmm. Not burn out. Right, right. So, so there is a special challenge when you're entering a role that is finite, um, because some people will um, treat you as a that finite person. They may not want to invest as much in the relationship. They may want. They're certainly not going to give you tasks that have a duration that goes beyond your uh, your tenure. And so, there is a limit to to what you can do. Um, one of the things I'd like to say to all of you is a really valuable thing that you can do, because I've, I'm on committees or boards and so forth, is to think about your successor. Think about the person that's coming in after you, and you can create um, value for them. Um, so as you're making your transition, what's working for you, what's not working for you, and how can you make it easier um, and a better experience for the person that's succeeding you? I'm entering a new role right now in a committee, and I got Nothing. Like literally, I'm like, wait, <laughs> nothing? <laughs> How, what am I supposed to do? So I'm creating the guide for the next person. I figure that you know, even if it's just a year, um, that's a valuable contribution. I might not be able to. I have my ramp up is so huge that I figure, well, I'll take my time on my ramp up because I'm not just going to act without getting my mission and my strategy down. I'm going to take the time to get my mission and strategy down, and then that'll be something. Was that a car truck? I thought it was my ma microphone. <laughs> um, but then you can give something to somebody else. So I'm going to move us along. Thank you for those for that sharing. It's very, it's it's so interesting. I mean, so so the key really here is in learning. And I, I know I've said that, but I can't emphasize it enough. The more you learn now, the better you're going to be down the road. And we like to think of of breaking down learning into three categories: factual learning. Um, you know, what are you doing? Who's who's who? Um, what are what are the services? What are the products? What are the rules? What are the procedures? That's kind of I mean easy to learn. It can be a huge amount of data, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, cultural learning is a little bit trickier, um, and it can trip you up. And we'll talk a little bit more about that too. And political learning, um, political learning. Um, a lot of people dis have a disdain for organizational politics. Some people love politics. But whether you like them or not, they exist, and you need to understand them because you will be a beneficiary or a victim of them. <laughs> so we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, this is a definition of culture. Um, you know, culture, some culture is clear and obvious, and some of it is not so clear and not so obvious. Um, but it has a lot to do with how people feel and what makes people feel comfortable. Um, behaviors, how they treat each other. Um, we can further break culture down into sort of family culture, which is really deep within you. Um, you may come from a similar family as other people, but what happens, what's happened in your home and how you live in your home uh, is a special part of your culture, um, and that's something deep within you. Um, you're going to be entering an organization that's going to have a culture that may be familiar, it may not be familiar. Um, different aspects of organizational culture include things like, you know, how do people treat time? Do meetings start on time? Are meetings where decisions get made or are they where people discuss decisions that have been made? Um, do people use email? Do they phone? Do they text? Do they meet in person? Um, it's important to understand this organizational culture because you can make a mistake. Um, and a silly little mistake can actually be costly, especially when you're first walking through the door. I had um, an experience once. I started a new job, and I um, got an email, and I hit reply all, and I said, you know, whatever I had to say, um, that answered the question. And as soon as, <laughs> within five minutes, somebody walked through my office door, and they said, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and I'm like, what? They're like, I should have I helped you. With what? Like, apparently, it wasn't okay just to sort of 
hit reply and answer that question, I was supposed to like create a memo and talk to 10 people and it wasn't proper just to like hit reply. Um, some communications have very formal, <laughs> some organizations have formal communication and some people are very informal. Some people like everything to be in writing and they like everything to be in an email. Some people um, just want it to get done. Um, it could be an entrepreneurial fast environment or it could be a really well established slow moving environment uh, where people really want control over what's happening. It's important to understand the culture because you don't want to operate with that outside of those cultural norms. It will cost you. People will feel, it'll make people feel bad. It could be embarrassing. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more. And then of course the, um, you know, you'll be entering um, a, a regional ethnic culture. Um, that's, that's a little bit uh, more on the surface and not as risky as, as an organizational culture. Um, some parts of culture are, you can see with your eyes or you can hear. Um, some things you don't, you can't. Um, one thing, just one example might be modesty, you know? How do people dress? Um, what's appropriate dress? Um, that, that could be up here, you can actually see that, but it comes from here, you know? Sometimes, you know, what, what are your assumptions about, about modesty? Um, what are, you know, how important is that in the culture you're entering? Um, you want to be aware of that um, because what people see on the surface is going to give them a message about what's below the surface. Um, in your packet, let's go back to your little handout, um, I've taken these, um, the, these terms are really to help you understand what these different types of culture are, um, and they're on this page here, same list. And then on here, um, I've given you some space to work. Um, and I'd love for you to start off by um, talking about your culture of origin and sharing with your partners um, different symbols, language, um, things that they may not know about your culture that fit into these different categories. <laughs> I want you guys to, to take the, to build on this conversation though. I'm sorry, I know it's a great conversation. Culture is endlessly fascinating. But I want you to take what you've been discussing and apply it. So on this next, um, on this next page, I want you to write down some examples of where you think the cultural differences are going to be a, present a challenge for you so in, the, in your I'd fellowship. I'd like you to discuss another um, facet of how you're going to work together. Um, and how do you see the situation you're going into? I, you know, sometimes um, you're, you probably already formed an opinion of what you're walking into, and in some cases, um, you may think there's a lot of work to be done, and you're walking into a disastrous situation, but you may get there, and the people there may feel like they've got a great success on their hands. They've done a lot of work that they're very proud of, you want to make sure that you, you, know, you understand how people perceive um, the environment you're entering. And you want to be respectful of that. But you also want to understand that because you know, where should, what's important to the people that are there. Um, there may be part of the environment that um, uh, you know, is in disarray, but that may not be your priority. You may have to focus on a different area. And different parts of different organizations will be in a different state. So as you're walking through, in, as you're walking in, you really want to understand how people there perceive things. So think of it as a little bit of an investigation. Um, and right now, I'd like you to talk um, probably with the, I don't know, the host fellow? Is that how you're calling? <laughs> but the one that's like at the location you're going to? Host? So the, ho the host fellow, is there a term for that? <laughs> All right, we just invented one then. So. Have the host fellow talk about the situation that you're entering um, and what that's apt to, to be like. everyone's attention. I have a confession to make. I, I, I didn't give you a bio break, <laughs> but I just took one myself. So I feel bad. If anyone has to go, uh, does anyone want to, uh, if anyone wants to go to the restroom or grab a drink, please help yourself. But I'm, I'm going to keep us going, but I'm sorry I didn't give you an official bio break. Do you have a question or are you stretching straight? So, oops. 
Oh well, those one are, those, they're feeding at the same time. Um, expectations is a really important thing that you're not going to be able to do in pair, but when you, when you get through the door, you're going to want to set expectations with your boss and with your stakeholders. Sometimes you think that even though you, know, you understand what your role is and what your direction is, but even if it's in writing, even if it's well established, um, sometimes your boss didn't read that or your stakeholders don't know that and they have other ideas of what they want you to do um, and they could theoretically hijack your mission. Um, you want to make sure that you understand what your boss ha expects of you um, and that it's very clear. Um, you know, I, I've been in situations where my expectations weren't aligned with my boss and I walked into a new job um, and it's kind of, it's really a kind of a hard experience to have because uh, I'm sure you all have a lot at stake in the next year. You have a lot at stake when you take on a new job. Um, you have choice, you have a career, you're trying to develop your career. If you don't know what your boss expects of you, um, you may be set up to be working, like set up to fail. So you don't want to be working really hard at something that isn't valued by your boss. You don't want to be focusing a lot of your energy in an area that isn't um, really aligned with what their goals and their needs are. Um, so you really want to make sure that you clarify, and I can't say that enough, that you're clarifying. Um, and as you clarify, what are the metrics? How are you going to be measured? Um, if you are expected to do something, um, what is that something? and how will you know that you've succeeded? What are the deliverables? What are the things that um, you will have done that shows that you have met expectations? Um, and then um, you wanna have the resources. If you know, you, somebody may have a great vision of what they would like to see happen, but if you don't have the resources to do it in terms of people, support, um, it could be political support. So, they want to change something. There's a process that they want in place. Uh, we want all of our, I don't know, I, I wish I had a good example from your industry, but I don't. We want all of our administrators to fill out the following forms because we need this data, and this data is really valuable. Okay, um, if you're expected to create a process and put a process in place, you will need support from senior leaders. You will need them to help communicate the message. Some person that nobody else knows that doesn't have an established presence is not going to be able to implement something without senior leadership support and that's a resource you know there's only so much senior leaders can do and so much support they can give um, and it may be um, IT resources or administrative resources um, but you if you're you when you set your goals and you have negotiated your your expectations you want to make sure that you can achieve them and that you're not put in a situation, an impossible situation. Um, so, you know, once again, these are all broke down, broken down as conversations. Some of them may get combined, but you want to think very distinctly about each of these conversations um, and making sure that you check all the boxes here. Um, and then course adjustment. Um, you will have to adjust somehow. You will be learning. Um, I recommend that you sit down 30 days after you've entered and say, and maybe even before, you, as you're walking through the door, set up a meeting 30 days out with your boss. I'm just gonna say boss and we'll assume that that's who you're dealing with. And say at that point, you know, and when you have that meeting, that's the meeting where you say, how do I need to change? What am I doing that's right? And what, do I, what am I doing that needs to change? Um, it's not, you should always be seeking feedback. And feedback isn't criticism, uh, it's an adjustment. Um, you know, you may be doing something that just doesn't fit um, or something that's slightly off target you, that you don't know. Um, it's really important and people aren't gonna tell you. I'm sure that's another cultural norm. Some cultures will actually tell you what you're doing wrong. Most cultures won't. <laughs> They'll let you keep doing it. Um, and, um, and so you want to build into 
your process in any job you have a feedback mechanism. Um, but I'd say, especially with your boss, um, and, and you want to come back to, um, you know, feedback on your communications and feedback on your, um, you know, what you're doing and how you're doing it and your goals. So that's something that um, I hope you use again um, in the future. And um, I know that you've done some goal setting, so, but I think I'm going to uh, continue to have you do a little goal setting. My, um, the last page is to define your priorities. You might not be in a position right now to define these priorities, but um, I'd like you to take a stab at it. Um, you'll be able to revisit this you know, in a few weeks, in a month's time, and maybe refine your priorities. Um, one of the things I'd like to point out is um, performance metrics um, and how you're setting these priorities. Um, looking out a year from now, what do you hope to achieve? Based on what you hope to achieve, all of these priorities should be feeding those goals and objectives. Um, and what you do should be measurable somehow. So if, gosh, can anybody give me an example of, this is actually a good time to grab a microphone if we have one easily available, yeah. Can anyone give me an example of what they think one of their priorities is? Um, hi, I'm Sarah. I'm going to Burundi and I'm still defining my priorities within work, but personally I want to become fluent in French. Ah. I have the basis, but it's one of my big goals for the year. So for me, I guess my indicator would be able to hold conversations without feeling completely exhausted <laughs> from doing it. Excellent. So that's a great goal. Um, I'm trying to think of how we can measure that. Hmm. <laughs> Get you a little exam somehow. <laughs> but so for you, your metric is going to be your sense of comfort, your stress level when you're trying to describe you know, w walking up to a stranger and having a conversation. It might be a stranger conversation, it might be a colleague conversation. I actually um, speak French, although I'm not going to do that right here, but um, I remember the moment where I had enough confidence that I knew that I was going to know what I didn't know in that conversation and that it was going to be okay. <laughs> that even if I couldn't use the right terminology, like, I need a thing that will dry my hair. <laughs> I didn't know blow dryer, but I knew that I could uh, communicate. You'll get there, and it'll be a great feeling when you do. So, good luck with that. Um, how about a professional? I'm, I'm a little, when you talk of priorities and uh, performance metrics, I think uh, this is going to depend uh, on uh, the activities that you have at hand. I'll, I'll be working with mothers and children, so if my priority is to reach uh, 1,000 mothers with, on PMT cities, then at the end of the day, the performance will be measured on whether I reach those 5,000 mothers or not. Right. Yeah. So I have a feeling that priorities and performance metrics will best answered when we are in the field as opposed to, you know. So you're saying that, that you're going to define those down the road? Yeah. yeah. Because I, I have a feeling that uh, uh, performance base will be tagged with activities which you're doing on a daily basis. Right. As opposed to theories. Right. Yeah. So, so, so for you personally, one of your priorities is to have an impact on pregnant mothers, I think you said, or to, to serve as many pregnant mothers as you can in your role. Uh -huh. But um, then the metric would be uh -huh. the number. On the number. On, because that is measured and, uh, yeah. Still, you know, you may have an impact on that, but you know, you may not be able to reach so many people. But you may be setting the stage for the next person who's going to reach people. You know, so so you may you may not be able to, you know, maybe you don't have a team of people to send out with your resources, but maybe you can set the structure for the team, or maybe you can help with the recruiting process, or maybe there's a lot of ways. And so there's different ways you can take um, strategic goals and then turn them into tactical goals. So a strategic goal would be to have the impact, and the tactical goals would be the number of people or creating the teams or creating the team process or the materials, 
I mean, there's a lot of things that you can do that can support um, a goal without necessarily attaining that specific metric. There's other metrics you can define. Yeah, thank you. This is great. Yes. Hi, I'm Savannah, and this is my co-fellow, Charles. And I think we're in a really interesting situation because halfway through the year, our organization is um, renewing a grant application. So working on the project up until the middle of the year and gathering research to support the grant application. And I think the tangible outcome is actually seeing the grant renewed and working on that process of crafting the grant. So it will, does your work and your fellowship depend on the renewal of that grant or is, but I don't think so. It's just one of the projects they work on. One so of the projects. We're going to be responsible for kind of going out and collecting the data that the programs are running correctly so that they can renew it. Great. And then, and so taking that, you know, your priority is, um, I hear my cell phone in my ear, is um, uh, data gathering. And so to expand upon that a little bit, um, you know, maybe you're setting up a process for a continued or more easy, easy data gathering process so that in the future, it'll be easier to, you know, to gather that data for future grant renewals. Um, right. So that's great. Well, that's a great project. I'm sure that'll be very interesting. Thanks. Good luck. Does anyone else want to share a priority? Yeah. Uh, one of my biggest priorities for the year is having a friendly and effective partnership with this guy. <laughs> I'm confident it's going to happen. You know, it's been a great week and a half. But when we're actually in our job, having weekly lunches, asking how each other how we're doing hanging out outside of work and also being wary of our workplace performance assessments is going to be pretty huge. Great. So the relationship is a great goal. Um, and, you know, you, you're going to be doing this. You might want, you might want to invest in that experience and have a good, to have a good time, but also um, the developing of the relationship is going to make you more effective at working together. You can support each other. Um, one of the things that I've done in, with different teams is we've done a five-minute check-in. And I don't know if this would be useful for anybody, but we start the morning. One of, one of my teams, I said, okay, you know, it's 9 o'clock, and each of one of us said, these are the three things, my three priorities for the day, boom, boom, boom. And we did that so that we knew whether we could support each other. Um, we knew what people were doing, and so it made us, hmm, okay. If it sounded more important than what we were doing, we could shift gears. Um, and if we knew what other people were doing, we could support them in achieving their goals. So it's just one idea. Um, but communication, that, I mean, I think that's great. I think you guys are set up for success. <laughs> Good luck. Um, so, you know, it would be great to take a stab at this. I know it's hard to, to say today what your priorities are going to be, and I assume that in 30 days you're going to revamp this. But let's just take a stab at um, saying what your priorities are. Maybe, you know, focusing on your personal priorities, um, and hopefully those will align nicely with the priorities of your boss. Um, but you'll probably want to revisit this again. Does um, anybody have a, a, uh, something that they think is a quandary or something that they want to share with the, with the room? Any, uh, anything they want to highlight for others? I think this, this is one of those things that you're going to, you know, you're there to support each other. Um, it's actually fabulous that you have each other entering these fellowships. Most people entering new jobs don't, sometimes they don't even have a mentor or a buddy or anybody. Um, so it's fabulous that you have each other because you'll really be able to help, help each other a lot. Um, so just going back to the framework, so we're talking about learning, cultural learning is a, is a key component. It's often overlooked. People often think, well, you know, here's how things get done, but they forget the how things get done amongst people part of it. Um, and another part of that is the political um, learning. Um, politics really is understanding who, uh, um, who are your stakeholders. Um, your stakeholders are your boss. Um, the stakeholders are the people that are in the department that you're working at. They are the people that put you there, the people that are responsible for you. Um, they are the people that want you, you to help them get something done. Um, I think it's worth taking some time to talk about who the stakeholders are going to be. Each of you has different stakeholders, um, but um, some of them might be where you came from, where you're going to later, um, mentors, people that have a role in your career. 
Um, this will be a pretty brief discussion, but I think it's a one worth having. Um, on page six, there's a little um, outline. You can list stakeholders and what you think their expectations are of you. If you don't have a list of your stakeholders, um, maybe you don't know who all of them are. Um, this is one of those things that you might want to revisit in 30 days um, because you may, you may find in 30 days that you know more about the organization. You may have more stakeholders than you thought um, and some of your stakeholders might be more challenging than others and you may learn more. So you may not have all the answers about what their expectations are, um, but um, clarifying those expectations is definitely an opportunity. Um, the next section is we're really going to kind of blow this up a bit um, and we're going to take quite a bit of time. Um, the, uh, this sheet um, where it says negotiating success with your stakeholders, usually th we do this as your boss, negotiating success with your boss. But in your, in your case, I switched it to stakeholders just because I'm not sure how many bosses you guys have. Um, and I think you probably have um, different people that you need to n negotiate your success with, um, including one another. Um, and so maybe we'll start this um, with you guys talking about how you communicate with one another. Um, communication is a really important thing um, and establishing how you're gonna communicate with people can take, a, can, can take some time. Um, but it's, it's best to try and work that out as soon as you can. Um, emails, you know, are you going to communicate by email? How often are you going to communicate? communicate? Are you going to copy people on everything or just important things? Or are you going to take all the important things and, and write them down and then do one email a day or one email a week? Um, are you going to have meetings? Are you going to start the day with a brief, what are your top fives? Are you going to have a meeting every week? Um, are you going to pick up the phone and call whenever you have an issue? Or are you going to text? Or are you going to, you know, what is your, what is your method for communicating? Um, it's, it's really important. I'm, I'm one of those people who I, I get about 200 emails a day and I, I hate when people assume that I've read their email. <laughs> I know that you should send someone an email and expect that they read it, but honestly, if it's really important, you need to speak to me or you need to speak to my assistant because um, as much as I'd like to read everything in an email, I never will. Um, and so um, I assume that if people have something really important that they're gonna actually speak to me or speak to my assistant. And that's a style thing. Um, I also, I prefer, I don't like to be copied on everything. Um, I like to have things summarized if possible. You know, so, so my assistant doesn't copy me on everything um, because um, it's just one more thing that I have to think about, I'd rather if it's, if you're just making, if you just want me to know that it got done, I'm assuming that, you know, I don't need to be copied on it. You need to just um, tell me in another way. So that communication is really important. Um, and so we're gonna, there's, there's five aspects of um, negotiating success. And I think that style, you know, how, um, you know, what, you know, the communication's a big part, but also, you know, why are you here? What, what is going to be, what is, gonna, what is meaningful to you? Um, how do you like to make decisions? How are we going to collaborate? Um, I'd like you to take some time to talk with the person that you're going to be with. It's co-fellow is the right term, partner, co-fellow. I'm using all sorts of terms, stakeholder. Um, why don't you talk with your co-fellow about how you're going to communicate, and then we'll move on from there. I'm going to just give you three minutes. And just to kind of summarize a little bit of what we talked about today. I'm glad you guys are having such great conversations. Um, I hope that um, this time was useful, um, that, you've went, that you did some productive thinking, and you know, hopefully you have something that you can use um, along your journey. Um, I know that you're got, you'll be coming back together 90 days after the start um, of your fellowships, and that's a really great time because you'll have some time to get to know the people and the process and the goals and you'll have, a t you'll have time to clarify all that and then you, know, you can support each other um, in figuring out how to you know, do a little course correction at about 90 days. So just to sort of summarize what you have in the first 90 days, the book itself, 
Um, it's really about accelerating your learning, so giving you a structure to think about learning and kind of giving you an idea of where you sh how you should focus your learning, the technical, cultural, and political areas. Um, negotiating expectations is really negotiating your success because, um, you know, pretty much um, it's nice to feel like a success for yourself, but it's really important to always be a success for your boss and your stakeholders as well. Um, you know, this, um, I didn't do strategy with you because I think mostly someone else is laying your strategy down for you um, and your team you're probably going to inherit. Um, we didn't talk about securing early wins, but that's something um, you might want to talk about and read that chapter in the book. Um, early wins are small, little wins, things you can do to make people happy along the way. Um, one of my favorite early win stories, um, uh, it was a new, um, a, a new chief operating officer um, for a plant, um, one of the, eight, one of the a telecom uh, company plants. And the person who put her in that job heard very quickly after she started the new job that she was great, um, that they just loved her. And he thought, you know, he was a, a, an experienced leader, and he said, thought, what could she do you know, in two weeks on the job that would make people love her so much? I mean, she's running a plant. She's got to make long-term investments and improvements in process and so forth. So he went down to, to see, you know, to visit and see how things were going. And they said, oh, we love her. Um, she fixed the gate. She fixed the gate. And he thought, what? Um, and it turns out they ha the, this plant was in a bad part of town, um, and the gate in the parking lot wasn't locking. And so people's cars were getting broken into, and it was a, a, an operation that went three shifts. So they were people there were 24 hours a day working, and people didn't feel safe going to their cars. And so this new plant manager fixed the lock by calling a locksmith, and everybody thought she was great. Now, that's great because she had all this goodwill and people felt really positive. She had a workforce that was a little rejuvenated. Um, this same person actually um, replaced old, uncomfortable office chairs. Um, and uh, you know, even though that those were very small budget items that had a very big impact on morale, so you should look for little opportunities you have to make little improvements in people's lives. Because little improvements, especially if they impact you personally, they go a long way. Um, and they can build you a lot of goodwill um, around people that might be able to help you create alliances. So you know, one, another thing to think about is what, who has to help you to get your work done? Usually we don't do things alone. Usually we're part of a team or we need support from different divisions and different operations. So that's something you want to think about too. Now your bosses should be thinking about this for you, um, but it's something you want to think about yourself. And then managing yourself, getting your feedback, learning, you know, improving, um, but also not beating yourself up, but, you know, but managing yourself in that environment. So I'll leave that up there. I've left the, the last you know, 10 or so minutes for questions. Um, I'm happy to talk about specific challenges people are facing or, you know, priorities. And there's always a few questions. Let's see, get a microphone here. <laughs> Thanks for all that nice effort. Nice try, though. <laughs> Shout out to the interns who get to run around so much to get mics to people. I um, can actually do it too. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I actually ran away screaming for my last job, um, which was exciting because I was also running screaming towards GHC. Um, <laughs> but I had a very, very difficult manager. Um, she was not the most communicative, which is ironic considering she was the communications director. Um, <laughs> and I just wonder, how do you how do you deal with a manager that does not manage well and mm -hmm. you don't necessarily have the outlet to tell this person that they don't manage well? I mean, how do you, and when you're in a situation where you're trying to make it work and it's incredibly frustrating and difficult and you've, you've tried to address it directly, you've tried to address it in, in, in numerous ways and you just seem to make no headway. Yeah. I mean, how do you deal with something like that where you're yeah. trying to make this relationship work and it's just not working? Yeah, no, that's a good question. So having a bad boss. Everybody, you will all have a bad boss at some point in your lives. Um, and there is a concept called managing up. Um, and there are books about managing your manager. Um, some managers haven't been educated as managers. 
there's a whole body of knowledge about how to manage people. And not everybody that's been promoted to the status of a manager has that education. Um, and so you, uh, as a person being managed by a bad manager, and this is so common, um, I, I think you just want, you, you don't want, what you can't do is undermine your boss because even if they are bad, people might not know that. Or they might do things, so their boss might think they're great, or they might be somehow doing something, you know, functioning for, it for their boss in a way that makes their boss very happy. Um, their opinion matters. Someday, you know, they may, you may, they may be your boss 20 years down the road again. Um, they may marry your future boss. You know, you don't know who, where that person's going. So even, no matter how frustrating it is to work for that person, and they may be stupid, and you know, you, you want to be careful how you manage them. But you have to manage your boss. And ultimately, in your job, in your position, in your role, you're, you know, you, yes, you're responsible to the organization, but first, unfortunately, you're responsible to your boss. Um, so you want to make sure, you know, if you're in a bad boss situation um, and you're trying to endure it, I mean, obviously you want to try and get out of that situation, but in the, it's in, let's just, in the context of the fellowship, it's a year. You can deal with it for a year. Um, just make sure that you know what's expected of you. If that boss can't be clear about expectations, write them out and say, oh, I think this is what I heard in our conversations. You know, deliver the expectations and then work towards the expectations. Um, and just, you know, have as little context as, you ha as, as possible. Um, but that's why getting things in writing is important and clarity is important. Um, and, um, you know, if, if you have a task, you know, just be very clear about what you're there to do and how, what success looks like and focus on that. And if your boss can't help you, maybe someone else can help you. Chances are, if, you ha if your boss is a bad boss, other people know that in the organization. Um, so you'll have sympathy, but you know, um, just focus on what you're doing and know that that's gonna end. <laughs> Um, I also have a question about culture clashes. So I, for example, I'm a little bit more like you. I don't want to be CC'd on everything, but I've had bosses in the past where you get CC'd on every little thing. So what do you do when you have even something as simple as that as a culture clash? Yeah. Um, depending on where the culture clash is coming from, you may not be able to manage it. You may, there may not be something you can do about it. I mean, you know, I can give you a very specific, you know, um, email strategy you know, put all their emails in one folder so that it doesn't clutter you. Um, you know, sort by their name, select and put them all in a folder and then look at them all with them on the phone or something like that and go through them so that you know what's important. Um, sometimes you don't want to address things head on. You have to sort of weigh whether or not it's worth your bullet, you know. Is that the bullet I want to shoot? Because um, you can't be shooting, you know, you can't be you know, you can't be shooting lots of bullets around, so you have to decide whether or not that culture clash is something you can live with, um, or whether it's something you want to confront, or whether there's some other way around it. You know, how, how important is it on the scheme of things, and what's the cost associated with getting it your way, you know, versus coping. <laughs> Good luck. Um, I just wanted to say that this has been really um, eye-opening for me um, because we've talked a lot about culture transitions um, and there was an example in the beginning of the book about David Jones like he was asked to come into this company and organize it and make things happen and when he got there um, there wasn't much structure and when he tried to do those things the people who had hired him were like oh we don't like this guy he doesn't get <laughs> what we're about so I think it's been really interesting to think about the fact that we are coming for one year, and if we do come into situations where the culture of the organization is much different than what we're comfortable with, we may be much more effective by, we definitely be more effective by adapting to that culture and working within that context than trying to change it to suit our priorities or our practices. So I just wanted yeah. to say that was really yeah. great. Yeah, no thank you. Um, culture change takes years. Um, so, you know, if, even if that culture is like wrong by like 20, you know, measures, you know, it's you know, inefficient, counterproductive, you know, people aren't honest, it's, you know, um, you're not going to change it in a year. You're not. Um, and 
as right as you might be, that may not matter, you know. Um, so, yeah, I would not try and change culture. I mean, it literally, it's like a huge project to try and change a culture. It takes, it takes three to five years to change a culture, and then you may not succeed because everyone's trying to fight the culture change. So hopefully you'll have success. <laughs> I have a question down here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two hands. <laughs> okay, we'll come over here. Um, we've talked a lot about not getting burnt out, and I'm going to be living in a situation where I'm living like five feet from my work, so I'm <laughs> really a little worried that that might turn into something where I'm working too much and not really taking personal time and not really taking recovery time. Yeah. Do you have any strategies that I could use to kind of cope with that or say yeah. no, what five o'clock that I have to go? Or yeah. So um, work-life balance is, is, is really important. Um, I uh, am a huge proponent of getting what you need and you need to define what you need. Um, and you know, your time, you need to start at the top of the pyramid with must-haves, and you have to put into your must-haves sleep, good food, you know, exercise, and time with people you love. And then you can add work. You know, you really, if you don't, if you're not the best person you can be, you're not going to walk into that office the best person you can be. And there's only so many hours a day that you can use your brain to do work, really. Um, if, if you're in a work environment where FaceTime is important, where you, your person in a desk is what your boss wants, it's kind of a bummer because, you know, nobody can be productive for more than, I don't know, I, I'm, I hate to say the word 10 hours a day, but I don't think you can do more, I don't think you can do that many, I mean, I know some of you guys know hospital settings and so forth and they, you know, people have to carry on. You know, uh, but honestly, you want to you want to be productive and focused when you're working, and then you want to be out of there. You know, um, but culture is an important part of this because is the culture that your face is on that desk from seven to seven? You know, is the culture that you eat at your desk or do you go out to lunch? Is the culture that you answer emails at 10 p.m. because your boss is, or Sunday morning you're on email? You know, you can't control the culture that you're entering, and you may have to do some of those things. You know, you may have to put up with it, but, you know, you know, I, I'm, you know, me personally, I mean, I have three kids, I run a company, I have limits. I mean, I don't care what's going on on my phone. It is not in my hand when I'm at, you know, when I'm eating, you know, with my kids, when I'm, you know, I get my exercise. I have to do that or else I would burn myself out. So I, I suggest highly that you schedule schedule. I schedule my exercise. I, ske I schedule things and nothing comes between me and the things that I schedule. There are certain things on my schedule I really don't care what crisis is. Someone else can, you know, deal with that crisis. And chances are you're not going to be dealing with a life or death situation. Um, if there's a building burning, you can forgo your workout and grab the fire extinguisher. <laughs> but otherwise, get your workout in or, you know, do what you need to do to keep yourself whole. So that's yeah. All right. I hope this won't happen, but <laughs> what if you really mess up your first 90 days? Do yeah. you recommend any strategies to rebound quickly and effectively? Yeah. People do mess up. Um, and uh, um, it's really hard to dig yourself out. And that's why it's really important to think about what the pitfalls could be in making mistakes. I think that if you make a mistake, you fess up, you apologize, you address it. <coughs> You know, I'm assuming your mistake was an accident, was inadvertent, you were doing the right thing based on your judgment. You know, people shouldn't hold that against you, but a lot of people might, especially if they take it personally. Um, but I would try really hard to move slowly. That's what I'd say, because, you know, once you've made the step, yeah, that step is, is, is uh, it's made. Um, and so just be careful. Um, but if you do make a mistake, everybody makes mistakes. You know, I always say, you know, well, I'm a mom. I say to my kids, you know, if you aim for perfect and you make mistakes, you'll be forgiven, you know, in certain situations, not everywhere. You know, obviously you're not going to be perfect everywhere. But if you're doing your best, you're going to make mistakes. So don't go for the, don't allow the other mistakes to happen, right? Don't be sloppy, you know, don't, you know, and I'm not saying you're sloppy. By God, I doubt you are. 
So, but um, you know, don't do the little things. So then you have your you have your goodwill. You have that extra cushion uh, of goodwill when you do make a mistake. So. Um, I'm going into a marketing position, and I think there's a lot of value from being someone from the outside that has a chance to maybe look at someone's communication uh, structures and their search engine and all that, and how everything's set up now, and kind of go in from the outside with a perspective of. Um, you know, maybe an audience member mm -hmm. to make those changes, but how do you balance like um, being a part of that team from their perspective and utilizing your perspective as an outside member so mm -hmm. that you're not just coming in like this is what we need to do. Yeah, no, that's a good. That's a really good question, and I think I understand your situation. So, you know, you may be coming in with this whole body of knowledge that other people don't have. Um, are they ready to receive it? You know, are they able to absorb it? Um, what, uh, you know, I think is similar to the situation you were speaking about over there with Davy Jones. You know, they may say, we want our operations to be beautiful, right? And we want our communications, marketing communications to be beautiful. But then the reality may be with that old PC and that one, you know, really inexperienced person managing it you know, and no cooperation from the people that need to be blogging, and no consistency uh, possible, and no money to update the website, and no, 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 you know, so from a marketing perspective, I, I, I can understand where some of the limitations might come from, but I work with clients, and, you know, we recommend a perfect state, and then we come up with a phased plan for how to get there, um, you know, a lot of people might not be ready to go to the final state, but it's nice to have something to aim for. No matter what that project may be or how insurmountable it may look, there's ways, you know, you can progress towards it. And you could sort of, you know, and, the, and no doubt the final state may have different components to it, and so maybe they focus on just this one or just that one. But probably, if they're bringing you in, they want to have your real opinion but I'd be careful about sharing it too broadly. I'm giving advice, is that okay? I feel bad. <laughs> um, you know, probably you wanna keep that with your boss and say, you know, so because you don't want your boss to look bad, that this is what it should look like, but this is what we're doing. Isn't that awful? You know, and you don't, you know, you don't want them to look like, oh, we, I can't do what we should be doing. You know, they, they don't, you, you wanna help them get to some place positive um, and show results and show some progress. Even if they have a strategic plan, that's progress, you know, and then make it maybe making some wins along the way. So, isn't that? Sure. Uh, oh, that's my timer, but. Hello? Hi, sorry, one second. Let me just turn this off. Where did that hello come from? Hi. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm just interested in the specific mention of 90 days. Uh, as far as I've gone, I've read other things about books, but there's a mention of the first, uh, like, months, uh, like uh, in Malawi, most of the people are interested, if you, if you talk about the president, the first maybe three months, first four months, sometimes maybe even a month, they want to see, okay, what decisions we make and how interacting with things around the places and yeah. the life on the ground. Yeah. So I just wanted to know why specifically I mentioned 90 days, because we are looking at, we are going into a field or a community where there are like stakeholders, as you are saying, we are talking about stakeholders who also have their own interests and they're also like, uh, maybe their own bosses or like supervisors where they're reporting to. So the interests might be different. So yeah. I'm looking at if somebody, okay, tries maybe to craft their own way in the way that, okay, let's, let me make sure that by the end of 90 days I achieve this something. But then the situation on the ground doesn't allow you to do those things. Then it brings down your moral yeah, Why yeah, specifically yeah. mention 90 days? Is yeah. there maybe a theory? <laughs> the 90, 90 days feel that maybe we, we can actually go along and start believing, okay? Yeah. Is that no, that's a great question. So, so what is the, ma why is, is, is 90 days a magic number? You know, what is, why, why 90 days? I mean, this is just a little bit of our research in terms of, you know, when you're new to a job, you're consuming value. You don't know a lot. Um, and people are investing in you and your time is being invested in getting you up to the ability to be productive and contributing to the organization, really. And so people understand, they should understand. Now, you're gonna walk into organizations throughout your life and they're gonna expect you to hit the ground running. Nobody hits the ground running. <laughs> you know, everybody has to have a ramp up period. Um, and so, 
you know, a typical ramp up period is 90 days, 100 days. Um, but really, when you're moving into a new role, you guys have a year. That's not a lot of time. Um, and so your ramp up, you know, the sooner you can ramp up, the better. Um, and you want to think about, you know, your position as a, your, your position as a ongoing uh, position. You know, you're going to be passing the baton on. So you're going to want to think about making it better for the next people because there's only so much you can do. You know, if you're transitioning here, that means you really have nine months. You're only doing things for nine months. But we were talking about the early wins, the little things you can do to make people happy in 90 days. You should not be thinking you're going to achieve big goals in 90 days. You know, 90 days is your learning period. It's your ramp up period. It's to understand the situation and maybe to figure out what you will be doing, you know, to refine your strategy, refine your goals, refine things. And so then after the 90 day period, when you've got your, your stage set, then you hit the ground running. So really 90 days is, is like the early transition time. In many jobs, we tell people they're transitioning for a year. You know, it takes a year to learn an organization and especially a culture, it takes two. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a time consuming process. So good luck. So thank you all. It was really a pleasure to be here with you this morning. I wish you luck. Go. Thank <laughs> you.